Welcome to Anatomy and Physiology. This is week four, where we'll be covering chapter 14 entitled The Autonomic Nervous System. In our four week unit on the study of the nervous system to date, we've looked at the central nervous system, specifically considering our brain and spinal cord, as well as we've looked at the various sensory and somatic motor divisions of our peripheral nervous system. This week, we'll look at another branch of the peripheral nervous system, that of our autonomic nervous system. And specifically, we'll focus our time on the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of our autonomic nervous system, sometimes referred to casually as our fight or flight branch and the rest and digest branch. Let's go ahead and consider these six topics of chapter 14. In this lecture, we're going to review the autonomic nervous system very generally, giving you an introduction to the branch of the peripheral nervous system. We'll then compare the autonomic nervous system to that of the somatic nervous system, looking back at chapter nine in our study of skeletal muscles. Thereafter, we'll delve into the two branches of the autonomic nervous system, specifically parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. Finally, we'll then look at the general anatomy of the autonomic systems, what organs are involved, and how are those organs innervated. So we'll consider both sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions at that point. As we begin this lecture, I want to recall, and we've looked at this before, the nervous system is composed of two branches. And so those are our two branches right here, the central nervous system, the topic of chapter 12, as well as peripheral nervous system, where we began this in chapter 13 with last week's material. We've considered the sensory or afferent division, and now we're going to move into this motor division. Last term, again, we looked at somatic nervous system where we considered skeletal muscles. In this week's lecture, we're going to consider the autonomic nervous system by which we have these two branches here and here sympathetic and parasympathetic. And this isn't a lengthy chapter. I'm simply introducing you to the material such that when you take your next step in your studies, whether that's nursing, paramedicine, etc., you have some familiarity with the subject. And added to that, we will rely on this information moving forward, looking at other systems of the body, such as our respiratory system, our digestive system, our urinary system, our cardiovascular system. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's first come up with a definition of the autonomic nervous system. Now, according to our textbook, the autonomic nervous system is simply defined as the system of motor neurons that innervate effectors that include smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. But there's a little more to it than that. First, our autonomic nervous system is another efferent pathway of the nervous system, leaving central nervous system and going out to effectors. And rather than controlling skeletal muscle and voluntary movement, it's responsible for controlling very key physiological variables, such as our core temperature, cardiac output, blood pressure, blood glucose levels, amongst other things. And all of those go on to maintain body homeostasis while we face daily situations. And our body does these things without us even consciously thinking about them. In fact, when we talk about control of the autonomic nervous system, we say it's controlled involuntarily. You might hear it called controlled subconsciously. And what this means is that we don't have to think about constricting our blood vessels so as to increase our blood pressure, or we don't have to think about increasing our heart rate to ensure more access to oxygen when we exercise, nor do we have to think about digesting the food we've eaten. All of these things happen without conscious thought. The autonomic motor neurons regulate various visceral activities. Remember, viscer organs by increasing or potentially exciting or decreasing, maybe inhibiting, activities at effector tissues. Again, those are cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. So in saying that, let's put all of these ideas together into a classroom definition of the autonomic nervous system. More broadly, the autonomic nervous system is a branch of the involuntary motor division of our peripheral nervous system, and it's responsible for the innervation of effectors, again, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands, and with that innervation, we're going to see an increase or a decrease in the activities of these effector tissues to help support homeostasis all while facing daily situations. As we consider the autonomic nervous system, I want you to highlight a few general facts about the system. First, as our textbook definition alludes to, 
The autonomic nervous system is involved in controlling our cardiac muscle, smooth muscles, and glands. And so I've said this a few times, I'll likely say it several more times throughout this lecture. These are our effectors, just like skeletal muscles were the effectors when we were talking about the somatic motor system. And our autonomic nervous system is responsible for fine tuning and making adjustments to those effectors throughout the day to help us maintain homeostasis. Next, the autonomic nervous system is composed of two branches, sympathetic branch and parasympathetic branch. We tend to say the sympathetic branch is our fight or flight branch, which we use under situations of the four E's. We have exercise and excitement, as well as under situations of emergency or embarrassment. So under those general scenarios, we're going to see activation of our sympathetic division of our autonomic nervous system. In contrast, we have the parasympathetic branch, which we use under situations of the three D's, digestion, defecation, and diuresis. Third, the two branches of the autonomic nervous system arise from different parts of the central nervous system. The sympathetic division arises from spinal nerves that branch off of the thoracic and upper lumbar regions of our spinal cord, whereas in contrast, the parasympathetic division arises from a handful of cranial nerves, cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, and 10, as well as some spinal nerves that branch from our sacral spine, sacral spinal nerves 2 through 4. Fourth, and finally, the autonomic nervous system is regulated at the subconscious level. And what that means is that unlike voluntary control we saw with our skeletal muscles, control of cardiac muscle, of smooth muscles, and glands is not controlled consciously or voluntarily. We can't consciously tell our heart to beat faster or our blood pressure to increase or decrease based on constricting or dilating some of those smooth muscles associated with our vessels. This image is taken from our textbook where we can see both sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. In this first image here, sympathetic innervation, our textbook will denote sympathetic activities and sympathetic innervation in green, whereas we see parasympathetic innervation in purple. So it's a convenient way for our textbook to help ensure that we don't get confused about the two branches of the autonomic nervous system. So in terms of these two images, when we look at our sympathetic division, we will see branches from our spinal cord from T1 to L2 comprising our sympathetic activities associated with that fight or flight response. And in contrast, if we look at the parasympathetic branch, we're going to see those cranial nerves. Again, it's going to be three, seven, nine, and 10, and I've listed them here, oculomotor, facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus, as well as a handful down here at the sacral region, S2 through S4. I wanna take some time in lecture to look generally at the differences between our somatic nervous system, which we've studied to date in chapter nine, and our autonomic nervous system, which we consider in this chapter with 14. But a word of caution before we do this, although I'll be contrasting the structure and function of these two systems throughout today's lecture, the autonomic nervous system doesn't operate independently from the rest of our nervous system. In fact, we are going to see all parts of our nervous system, both central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, our sensory or afferent division, and our motor division. And then from motor, looking at our somatic motor and autonomic, we see all of those things working together. So what are the four primary differences between autonomic and somatic nervous systems? Well, we're going to see differences in the type of effectors we are targeting, in the efferent pathways, in the effects of neurotransmitter released at a synapse, and in terms of the innervation of the effector. Let's go ahead and look at each of these four individually. Our first difference between the autonomic and somatic nervous systems is that of effectors. Specifically, when we consider the somatic motor system, our effectors were skeletal muscles. But in contrast, when we consider the autonomic nervous system, our effectors are cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. And so this image here just gives you a brief visual of that. Here, we're going to see a neuron associated with somatic nervous system where we're targeting our skeletal muscle. In contrast, when we consider our autonomic nervous system, remember we have two branches and most of our sympathetic branch is going to look like this, but when we consider our adrenal gland, and we'll look at this later on in lecture, we're gonna see just some minor differences. Overall, we're going to see that our sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions target, again, glands, heart, and the smooth muscle. 
The second difference between our autonomic and somatic nervous systems is that of the efferent pathways used. In terms of our somatic motor system, an axon of a single myelinated somatic motor neuron is going to extend from the central nervous system all the way to the motor end plate associated with a skeletal muscle fiber. So we saw that back in chapter nine. In contrast, in our autonomic motor system, the pathways consist of two motor neurons in a series by which one is going to follow another. And so we see that here, here is our somatic nervous system. We're going to have one cell body within the central nervous system. That axon extends out ultimately communicating at the motor end plate with a skeletal muscle fiber. Autonomically, we tend to see this first image here, or this third image right here, where we will have two motor neurons, motor neuron number one, motor neuron number two, associated with an organ. And we see that same thing here. We're gonna skip the adrenal gland for now. In this manner, we will see cell body of motor neuron number one leave the central nervous system, that axon extends out into the peripheral region. We will then synapse with the cell body of another motor neuron, and that axon is going to go on to innervate an organ. We see the same thing with parasympathetic activity. One motor neuron with the cell body positioned within the central nervous system, axon extends out, is going to synapse and communicate with motor neuron number two, which goes on to communicate with our effectors. Now, one more thing I think is worth pointing out here. In the autonomic motor system, we have a very specific pattern that's going to be followed. If we look at our first motor neuron here and our first motor neuron here, we see that these are lightly myelinated here and here. But when we look at our second motor neuron, we're going to see that these are unmyelinated. And this is a pattern we're going to follow throughout the autonomic nervous system. In contrast, when we look at our somatic nervous system, we saw that one motor neuron extending from the central nervous system very heavily myelinated as it then comes in communication with their skeletal muscle. There's also a difference in the effects of a neurotransmitter when considering or comparing the autonomic and somatic nervous systems. In our somatic motor system, all somatic motor neurons release acetylcholine. So when we looked at our skeletal muscles last term, we saw release of acetylcholine at the synaptic cleft, crossing the synaptic cleft, binding to our skeletal muscle fiber, exciting that skeletal muscle fiber. In contrast, in the autonomic motor system, autonomic motor neurons release either acetylcholine or norepinephrine, sometimes on occasion epinephrine, and depending on the type of receptor at the site of the effector, the effects of these neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, sometimes epinephrine, could either excite that effector or may inhibit an activity of that effector. And we'll go through why that is later on in lecture. Finally, we also see a difference in the innervation of the effector. Specifically in the somatic motor system, we have one somatic motor neuron associated with an effector. In contrast, in the autonomic motor system, because the autonomic nervous system is composed of two divisions, sympathetic and parasympathetic, the effectors have two types of innervation. Innervation from a motor pathway associated with the sympathetic branch as well as innervation from a motor pathway associated with the parasympathetic branch. Now, there are a few exceptions to this where we might find some effectors innervated by autonomic fibers only innervated by sympathetic fibers. However, generally, we see both sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. To better understand this, let's go ahead now and look at the two divisions of our autonomic nervous system. Our two divisions of the system, again, sympathetic and parasympathetic. In the sympathetic nervous system, commonly referred to as our fight or flight system, we see the system activated in times of fear, in times of stress, that excitement, exercise, embarrassment, and emergency. So those four E's. And under those situations, we are going to pull a ready store of energy and make it available to us for fight or flight for whatever fear or stressor we're experiencing or facing. 
And in addition to making a ready source of energy available to us through the release of things like glucose into the blood from our liver, from our skeletal muscles, sympathetic nervous system innervation also redirects blood flow to our skeletal muscles, to our brain, to our heart, to our lungs, the important things involved in fight or flight. We see dilation of our airways to help us prepare for an increased need for oxygen and increased need to rid ourselves of carbon dioxide. That sympathetic division, remember, we're going to see that here between T1 and L2. This is the only area by which we're going to see fibers departing the central nervous system associated with this type of innervation. In the parasympathetic nervous system, something we commonly refer to as rest and digest, where we're facing those three Ds of digestion, defecation, and diuresis, we see the system activated when we're looking to keep body energy use low, such as when we're sitting at our desk studying, after we've eaten a meal, or relaxing on the couch. Those are all activities by which we want to be in that rest and digest phase. And just remember, we are considering cranial nerves number three, seven, nine, and 10 up here, as well as sacral innervation, sacral nerves number two through four. Now, sometimes you're going to see sympathetic innervation. We might not say T1 through L2, but rather we're going to say thoracolumbar innervation. And that simply means that innervation is coming from the thoracic and lumbar regions. In contrast, we might say the parasympathetic innervation is craniosacral because we are pulling fibers out from our cranial region as well as from the sacral region. The sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers are components of the same autonomic nervous system, but they're going to differ structurally in a few important ways. First, they differ in nerve fiber origin. And now I'm just repeating myself over and over again, so thanks for your patience with this. Our sympathetic fibers are what we call thoracolumbar, so T1 through L2, whereas our parasympathetic fibers are craniosacral, originating from that handful of cranial nerves and the sacral nerves S2 through S4. So nothing new, I've now mentioned this a handful of times. Second, the length of nerve fibers are different between the two branches of the autonomic nervous system. Recall we have two fibers. The first one leaves the central nervous system and extends out into the periphery. With our second, we see a synapse by which the axon of the second will end up innervating with our effector. So length of nerve fibers are different between the two branches. In the sympathetic division, we have what are called preganglionic fibers. They're relatively short. Then we're going to see postganglionic fibers that are relatively long. So what do I mean by that? When we talk about these fibers extending from our central nervous system here or here, when we consider the sympathetic branch, we're going to see very short fibers extending out from the central nervous system they are going to then synapse with some really long fibers that will ultimately innervate our effectors. In contrast, when we look at our parasympathetic branch of our autonomic nervous system, we're going to see the opposite. We are going to see a very long fiber extending out from our central nervous system, synapsing really close to an organ, and then we're going to see a very second small branch then go on to innervate the given organ. Now, in terms of the location of ganglia, recall ganglia are clusters of nerve cell bodies located outside the central nervous system, and they play a crucial role in the transmission of signals from our preganglionic neurons to the postganglionic neurons. We find in our studies that we have ganglia near the spinal cord with our sympathetic innervation. So we see ganglia here. This is going to be the point by which we see cell bodies associated with those longer fibers, whereas we're going to see ganglia by which synapse happens very close to our effectors in our parasympathetic division of our autonomic nervous system. Before we proceed any further with a detailed examination of our autonomic nervous system, I'd like to make sure you have a firm grasp of the anatomical components of our autonomic motor pathway. Recall our autonomic nervous system is made up of two motor neurons, and there are a few exceptions to this, but two neurons and they have names. And so I used them just a moment ago, but we're gonna have preganglionic neurons, the first neuron of our two neuron chains. So here is our first neuron with a cell body in the central nervous system. That axon is going to extend out into the peripheral system. It will then synapse 
here at a point we call the ganglia, a group of cell bodies. And what that means is we have cell bodies associated with our postganglionic neuron by which our first neuron will synapse. And so with that in mind, we're going to have preganglionic neurons. We have postganglionic neurons, just denoting the neuron before the ganglia and the neuron after the ganglia. Again, just a review, ganglia are simply collections of cell bodies located outside the central nervous system. And in this case, they're the point of synapse between preganglionic neurons and postganglionic neurons. Now, our intricate and complicated body wouldn't be just that without having separate ganglia for different systems. In this case, we have two different types of ganglia. We have sympathetic ganglia, and so our sympathetic ganglia or sympathetic chain ganglia, these are the sites of synapse between sympathetic preganglionic neurons and our sympathetic postganglionic neurons. And we have two different types of sympathetic ganglia. First, we have what are called sympathetic chain ganglia. And depending on your textbook and the literature you're reading from, you might also hear them called vertebral chain ganglia or sympathetic trunk ganglia. I tend to refer to them as sympathetic chain ganglia. And they look a little like a chain or a strand of beads. They're going to be found very close to and lateral to the spinal cord. And we would see one here. If this is our spine or our spinal cord, we're going to see one of our sympathetic chain ganglia on one side of the spinal cord, and we would see one here. So again, sympathetic, we're looking at T1 through L2. We're going to see preganglionic fibers depart central nervous system, synapse here at the chain ganglia, and then we're going to see the second fiber, the postganglionic fiber, move out to the periphery to innervate those effectors. Our second type of sympathetic ganglia is that of collateral ganglia, or sometimes it's referred to as paravertebral ganglia. And these ganglia lie in front of the vertebrae, near large thoracic, abdominal, and pelvic arteries, for which those structures help give them their name. So we are going to see those collateral ganglia found more anterior or more ventral to the spinal cord. So those are the two type of ganglia we see associated with sympathetic innervation. We tend to talk most in class about these sympathetic chain ganglia. We also have parasympathetic ganglia. These ganglia are at sites of synapse between our parasympathetic preganglionic neurons and our postganglionic neurons, and they are referred to as terminal ganglia. You might also find literature calling them intramural ganglia. The terminal ganglia are located very close to their effectors, sometimes even within the effectors, and that's the reason most preganglionic axons are so long. We need one really long fiber to get really close to an organ. These ganglia are all very uniquely named according to the visceral organs they're ultimately associated with. I don't address that in terms of this course, so you don't need to know the specific names of the ganglia, though our textbook will go into it. Right now, you should just know their general location in comparison to sympathetic ganglia. You should know that they're responsible for delivering information to the body about rest and digest activity. And what I like about this particular slide here is this is showing the connection of both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers, that idea of dual innervation. Here we're going to see sympathetic activity extending from T1 through L2 targeting our organs. Here on this side, we will see cranial nerves number three, seven, nine, and 10 extending from this region to some of our more superior organs, as well as most of our digestive tract. We have a bit here from S2 to S4 that's going to innervate the very lowest part of our digestive tract, the lower part of the large intestine, as well as bladder and some of our reproductive system. This image is taken from the anatomical images from our PAL site, and we see our sympathetic chain ganglia found nearby the spine. We see highlighted here in blue and labeled as sympathetic trunk ganglia. We see them here not highlighted, so we would see these on either side of the spine. These are going to be points of synapse for our synaptic fibers with preganglion synapsing with postganglionic neurons.
In contrast, this image is taken from the cadaver images from our PAL site, and we see sympathetic chain ganglia here as well. We've seen the removal of most of our visceral organs. We're going to see a particular vessel. I think this is our aorta. It could be vena cava, but I'm assuming this is our abdominal aorta. And we see sympathetic trunk ganglia here. We also see it not highlighted here. What I want to do now is turn to understanding what events occur as a result of activation of these two branches of our autonomic nervous system. And so I want to begin with activation of our sympathetic division. I'll go down this list of target tissues and expected response. So first we see sympathetic response is going to target the heart. Now, when we imagine that fight or flight scenario, we need to get away from something. So we want to see an increase in heart rate and an increase in cardiac output. If we imagine being in that fight or flight scenario, we might need to run away and that's going to require us to rely on our skeletal muscles, which requires a lot of glucose for energy as well as a lot of oxygen. By increasing our heart rate, we can pump more blood and by increasing cardiac output, that means we can pump more blood per heartbeat. And so this is a win-win for our tissues, which are going to be relying on more available oxygen and glucose, as well as we'll need to rely on that blood to pick up wastes at the tissue level as we're burning that glucose. In our fight or flight situation, we also wanna increase our oxygen supply to the body. And to do this, we need to take more air into our lungs. And in fact, we do this not only by increasing our rate of breath, so the rate of breathing, but also by increasing the amount of air we breathe in with each breath. Specifically, we target smooth muscles of our bronchioles where when they're dilated, we can take more air in and send more used air out with exhalation. That process of targeting the smooth muscle and causing our bronchioles to relax, we call that bronchodilation. And that's going to enhance the diameter of our bronchioles. So increasing, if you imagine these tubes, increasing the diameter of those tubes, which will reduce airway resistance and facilitate that increase in airflow into and out of the lungs. Under conditions of sympathetic stimulation, we won't really want to be focused on digestion of food. And in fact, the sympathetic stimulation results in a drop of blood supply to the digestive tract. It's going to result in a drop in the release of gastric enzymes, as well as the temporary slowdown of smooth muscle contractions called peristalsis. We aren't needing to focus on food digestion, but rather we wanna take that investment and send it somewhere else. We're going to divert blood to our brain, to our heart, to our lungs, to our skeletal tissue. We'll worry about digestion later when we're safe. Now tied to that, we need to look at our sphincters. Our sphincters are going to close because we really don't need to worry about urination or defecation. We don't need to worry about the movement of food stuff between one compartment and another within the digestive system. Now further, looking at our pancreas, this is an endocrine gland, and we want to see our pancreas secrete a hormone called glucagon. And glucagon goes on to target the liver and skeletal muscles to free up some of the stored glucose that we have in the form of glycogen. We wanna gain access to as much stored glucose as we can find throughout the body to fuel our muscles. Now, in addition to all of these things, there are still more things to consider. So sympathetic nervous system controls pupil dilation. Specifically, innervation is going to target a muscle we call the dilator pupillae, which when it's activated by this branch of our autonomic nervous system, it causes the pupils to dilate. And why would that be important? Well, pupil dilation allows for more light to enter the eye, which helps enhance visual sensitivity, especially in low light conditions. Pupil dilation may further help navigate challenging environments by broadening the visual field, detecting potential threats. We're ultimately better equipped to respond quickly to some type of dangerous external stimulus. Finally, dilation of the pupil may enhance distance vision, which, which could be advantageous in assessing an area for those potential threats or dangers. Now we're getting close to the end of this list. 
We also are going to see constriction of some of our visceral blood vessels, so the vessels that feed our organs, as well as constriction of some of the cutaneous blood vessels that we have through our body. So we're turning off blood flow to our skin or reducing blood flow to our skin. This is a means by which we can divert blood from the less important things, our kidneys, skin, other things, and again, divert blood supply to the important places that help us with fight or flight, brain, lungs, heart, skeletal muscle. Additionally, sympathetic activities target our sweat glands. We end up sweating as a means of cooling off. And finally, we can talk about sympathetic innervation to our reproductive system. Now, maybe not under the normal fight or flight scenarios, but it's worth mentioning, we'll see in a little while, that parasympathetic activity encourages sexual arousal, but as it pertains to sympathetic activity, in males, the process of orgasm and ejaculation of semen is associated with sympathetic innervation. And in females, activation with sympathetic innervation is associated with orgasm, the rhythmic contractions of various pelvic smooth muscles. So take some time to consider each of these activities and make sure that they make sense to you. Before we leave our discussion of the sympathetic division of our autonomic nervous system, I would like to take a look at some slides outlining the pathways by which fibers run. First, what I'd like to do is just return back to this image real briefly, mentioning our posterior gray horns, our anterior gray horns, and within the T1 through L2 region, we have what are called lateral gray horns. And in terms of sympathetic innervation, we want to look at fibers that extend from the spinal cord in the region of T1 through L2 with fibers extending from these lateral gray horns found here and here. And so now looking at this particular image, here is a lateral gray horn. We've looked at this image before. This was our dorsal root by which we have sensory information coming into the central nervous system. This green line represented motor information at the ventral root heading out to the body. But here we have this pink line, and this pink line is going to extend from our lateral horn, and we're going to see the cell body here originating from our preganglionic fiber extend out. And so let's talk about this now. As we follow this pink fiber, we're going to follow it out the ventral root. It shares a pathway with our motor neuron, and we're going to see it do something a little different. We're going to see it travel along this pathway, and it takes a little detour here. And then we're going to see a point of synapse by which we will see more fiber information heading out along this spinal nerve or the ventral ramus of the spinal nerve. So what's happening here? Well, remember we have preganglionic neurons and postganglionic neurons associated with the autonomic nervous system. This sympathetic fiber, if we follow this fiber all the way here to this point, this is our preganglionic fiber, lightly myelinated. It is going to synapse with the cell body of our postganglionic neuron. And this is an unmyelinated neuron that will travel along this little area and then out via the ventral ramus of our spinal nerve. Now, what is this structure right here? This is going to be one of those bead-like structures of our sympathetic chain ganglia. So this is simply a point of synapse between our preganglionic neuron and the postganglionic neuron. And we have two special names for these little detour points as we see our preganglionic fiber move in. We call this our white ramus communicans. We consider it white because this is holding a lightly myelinated fiber. And remember, myelin can appear somewhat white in nature. In contrast, our postganglionic neuron is going to be non-myelinated, so a bit more gray. And so we call this little pathway or this detour the gray ramus communicon. Now, if we look here, if we look at this image, and this is an image we considered in chapter 13, and we overlook some things in chapter 13, but now we're going to focus in on that a little bit more. We are looking here at our ventral or anterior part of our spinal cord by which we see this root. Remember, this is our ventral root. It's going to carry motor information out. It will also share a pathway with our autonomic fibers, those sympathetic autonomic fibers. We would see travel out and we're going to see it come in, take this detour, this little off ramp here, the white ramus communicans, we're going to see a point of synapse with a cell body associated with the postganglionic neuron, 
and then we will see it route back in via our gray ramus communicons before we see it travel out the shared pathway with the ventral ramus of our spinal nerve. And so this, again, this activity with this pink is only found between T1 and L2 where we have sympathetic fibers extending from the central nervous system. I like to think that this image is going to put everything together for you, where I've outlined the pathway a sympathetic fiber takes. We begin with the cell body of our preganglionic neuron leaving the spinal cord via ventral root, where we're going to join up with here the dorsal root to form our spinal nerve. Next, that sympathetic fiber, the preganglionic neuron, the preganglionic axon is going to take this detour, this little off-ramp called the white ramus communicons. We're going to see a point of synapse by which then we're going to synapse with the postganglionic neuron, the cell body of the postganglionic neuron. That axon is then going to leave gray ramus communicons and travel out here. So let's look at this fiber pathway. First, preganglionic cell body in the central nervous system. We will then extend out of the lateral horn, joining up with the ventral root, creating the spinal nerve, white ramus communicons, point of synapse with the cell body of our postganglionic neuron found within that sympathetic chain ganglia. Depart now postganglionic fiber out the gray ramus communicons, and then we're going to travel via branches of this ramus to our effector organs and tissues. Recall this is only going to occur between T1 and L2 associated with the sympathetic division of our autonomic nervous system. I do want to point out that there are some additional pathways by which we might see synapse occur. According to our textbook, we might see this fiber travel out and up to another bead-like structure, so another ganglia, or travel out and down to another ganglia before there is a point of synapse. And on occasion, and as we're going to see with our adrenal gland, we might see that this preganglionic fiber heads through our sympathetic chain ganglia and doesn't synapse at all. So do be aware of that. This is a general way by which I discuss it, but there are some alternate pathways by which we can move up or down or potentially head all the way out before we ever synapse. Now I want to take a step back, look again at the big picture, see how we can examine all of these synapsing activities here. So we see preganglionic fibers, points of synapse, by which then those postganglionic fibers move out to innervate effectors. And again, let me just point out, most ganglia we will see here for synapse, but on occasion we will see some ganglia out here. Now, we have a unique situation in the adrenal gland. In fact, it's doubly unique, but not to get ahead of myself. First, let me explain the adrenal gland. So we're looking at our adrenal gland right here. We're going to forget this second image here for a moment. The adrenal gland is an endocrine gland bound just superior to the kidney. So here's our kidney. Here is our adrenal gland. And it's made up of what we call an outer cortex here. We see this outer cortex and we're going to see an inner medulla here. And so outer cortex, inner medulla. Now, the outer cortex isn't going to be important to us at the moment. We're going to come back to it in chapter 16, but let's focus on the inner medulla and back to the two unique things about the adrenal gland. First, recall earlier, I said most, but not all organs are duly innervated by the autonomic nervous system. That is, most organs are innervated by a sympathetic set of fibers as well as a parasympathetic set of fibers. But that's not the case for the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is one of just a few examples of an organ or tissue that isn't duly innervated. It only has sympathetic innervation, no parasympathetic innervation. And so we can compare that. If we look at now this image, we are going to see innervation of sympathetic fiber extending from our central nervous system, a preganglionic fiber that is going to come all the way into our adrenal medulla and we're going to see a point of synapse. Now that is compared to the heart here by which we're going to see extension of parasympathetic fibers innervating the heart as well as sympathetic 
fibers innervating the heart. And most organs and tissues of our body do have this parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation. The adrenal gland is a little different. So let's understand what's happening here. And that's that's the first unique thing is that we have not dual innervation, but single innervation just associated with sympathetic fibers. However, we do have something else unique about our adrenal gland. Referring to this image right here, we're going to see a sympathetic fiber extending out of the lateral horn, down our ventral root. Then we're going to see it move to spinal nerve. We're going to see it move out the white ramus communicans through the chain ganglia. We're not going to see synapse. We still see preganglionic axon moving out into the body and synapsing here at the medulla. So we don't see synapse here in the chain ganglia, that we would have seen in some of our earlier lecture material. Now, why is this special? Well, you would expect to see both a preganglionic and postganglionic neuron, and we don't see that postganglionic neuron, or at least at first glimpse, we don't see the postganglionic neuron. Now, what we actually see, we are going to see points of synapse. We will see points of synapse here by which we have just the cell body of this postganglionic neuron found within the adrenal medulla. There are no axons. And so what that means is when we travel down in synapse hair, we're going to release acetylcholine by our preganglionic fibers, that neurotransmitter will act on those cell bodies. And in turn, that cell body, those cell bodies, are going to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now, those neurotransmitters are going to find their way into the bloodstream, where they will travel to the body to target tissues. Now, why is this important? Well, this is truly an important way by which we can experience that fight or flight, that surge of adrenaline is our epinephrine. And what we'll find is as we release neurotransmitter out into the blood, remember our adrenal gland is a is an endocrine gland and endocrine glands release hormones. So here we have a neurotransmitter or a set of neurotransmitters being released, but those neurotransmitters are also hormones. And so we can actually call what we release the epinephrine and norepinephrine by those postganglionic cell bodies found within the adrenal medulla. We call those a neurohormone. And so this is the reason we say that the adrenal gland is slightly different in comparison to other organs, first of all, we have just sympathetic innervation and our postganglionic neuron only has a cell body. This image taken from our PAL site shows our adrenal glands here and here positioned lateral to our spinal cord by which we see resting right on top of or superior to our kidneys. So right kidney, left kidney. Here's another example from our PAL site by which we see adrenal gland sitting atop of or superior to our kidney. Turning away from the sympathetic division of our autonomic nervous system, let's go ahead now and look at parasympathetic activation. Whereas sympathetic activation increased heart rate and cardiac output, we're going to see parasympathetic activation reduce heart rate, reduce cardiac output. We simply don't need to pump as much blood to the tissues for delivery of oxygen and glucose and picking up some of our wastes. Further, we don't need to take in as much oxygen. We don't have as much carbon dioxide to blow off. Thus, we see bronchoconstriction of our bronchioles. And in this manner, we see constriction of the smooth muscle of the bronchioles. We had dilated them earlier. Now we are going to see constriction leading to a decrease in the diameter of our airways, which increases airway resistance. And further, parasympathetic activation is going to promote mucus secretion in our respiratory pathway, ensuring a more protective environment for our lungs. Under parasympathetic stimulation, we're relaxed, and with this in mind, we can return our focus to our digestive system. Parasympathetic innervation is going to result in an increase in blood supply to the digestive tract, 
We're going to see an increase in the release of digestive enzymes to help break food stuff down. And we're going to see the pickup of peristalsis, that smooth muscle contraction that helps move food stuff along our digestive tract. In the resting state, we're going to look at sphincters and they're going to relax. So not just our digestive sphincters, but relaxation is also going to allow for the relaxation or control of our urinary and anal sphincters too. Returning to the pancreas, where we relied on the release of glucagon earlier to make glucose more readily available from the stores of glycogen we had in our muscles and our liver, now we can rely on the release of insulin by the pancreas to store excess glucose we have in the blood as we pick up digested food stuff. As it pertains to the pupil and direction of light, parasympathetic nervous system activation results in pupil constriction. Smaller pupils reduce the amount of light that enters the eye, preventing excess light from reaching the retina, which helps prevent visual issues. It further helps maintain visual clarity, and together with controlling the shape of our lens, it enhances the depth of field to contribute to the eye's ability to focus on nearby objects, rather than focused on those faraway objects that might have helped us assess a threat situation. Now before, we talked about the sympathetic innervation of visceral blood vessels and cutaneous blood vessels. We turned a bunch of supply off because we wanted to divert blood to those important things like brain, heart, lungs, and skeletal muscles. There is no opposing parasympathetic activation. When sympathetic activation is turned off, more blood is going to perfuse through these vessels, feeding our cutaneous membranes, as well as allowing for more blood flow to our visceral organs. And similarly, when we talked about sympathetic innervation to sweat glands, there's no opposing parasympathetic activation of our sweat glands. When sympathetic activation is turned off, we simply cut off target to the sweat glands. Thus, we stop sweating. And finally, we can talk about parasympathetic innervation to our reproductive system. In this rest and digest phase, we tend to say parasympathetic activity, together with help from hormones and neural signals, encourages sexual arousal. We see vasodilation and increased blood flow to both the penis and to the clitoris, contributing to the physiological changes associated with sexual excitement. Ultimately, both penis and clitoris become erect with the help of blood engorgement. In these next few slides, we're going to review some material back from chapter 13, and specifically, we're going to look at the four cranial nerves that have some parasympathetic function. Cranial nerve number three, our ocular motor nerve. Cranial nerve seven, our facial nerve. Cranial nerve nine, our glossopharyngeal nerve. And cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. Recall back from chapter 13, cranial nerve number three, our ocular motor nerve, is one of three cranial nerves involved in the motor movement of the eyeball with the help of skeletal muscles. In addition to that, and more to the point of this chapter, cranial nerve number three is responsible for the control of pupil size with the help of parasympathetic innervation. Last chapter, we said cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve, is responsible for quite a number of activities. It's involved in our sense of taste, where we see it innervate the anterior two-thirds of our tongue. It's also involved in facial expression and in some motor control of our head and neck. Now, as it pertains to autonomic function, parasympathetic innervation targets various secretory glands, the lacrimal gland, our nasal glands, some glands that are involved in the production of saliva, like our submandibular gland, our sublingual gland, and our palatine gland. So all of these activities, when you imagine these secretory glands, parasympathetic is that rest and digest. We can start producing saliva that's going to help us with the initial mastication of food. We don't have to worry about a bunch of saliva in our mouth because we're not in this fight or flight scenario. Same goes with the lacrimal gland as well as our nasal glands. Last chapter, we said cranial nerve number nine, our glossopharyngeal nerve, is responsible for a number of activities. It innervates the tongue and provides us the ability to taste using the posterior one-third of our tongue. It innervates muscles involved in conscious swallowing, and it helps with baroreception and chemoreception. But specific to this chapter, and as we see underlined, we see innervation of the parotid gland, that's also going to be aiding in the production of saliva in that rest and digest phase of relaxation, similar to what we saw with cranial nerve number seven. 
Lastly, we said cranial nerve number 10, our vagus nerve, is responsible for innervation of our vocal cords of the larynx, so it's going to help us with speech, and the sensory detection of our visceral organs. But as it pertains to parasympathetic innervation, cranial nerve number 10 innervates a substantial number of our visceral organs, much of the abdominal cavity down into the pelvic cavity, that upper large intestine, where we're going to see help with digestion, when we're in this rest and digest state of mind. In the last slide, we left off inferiorly with innervation of our upper large intestine. Remaining visceral organs of the lower abdominal and pelvic region are actually going to be innervated parasympathetically by our sacral nerves. Our lower large intestine, the urinary system, and the reproductive system all have parasympathetic activity given S2 through S4. Now, this is the last slide in our study of chapter 14 and the autonomic nervous system. And in closing, I want you to walk away with the knowledge that the autonomic nervous system helps maintain homeostasis through the concerted efforts of both sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. And further recognize that the effects of the autonomic nervous system to our tissues and our organs throughout the body are carried out by three substances, primarily acetylcholine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. And these substances stimulate activity in some tissues while inhibiting activity in others. And as we move through the remainder of the school year and look at organ systems such as the cardiovascular system, our respiratory system, our digestive system, amongst other systems, We'll continue to address, maybe a bit more casually, but we'll continue to address the effects of our autonomic nervous system on those given body systems. And so with that, I wish you a good week in your studies of this chapter. And when we return again, we'll begin the study of chapter 15 and our special senses. Make it a great day, everyone.